The title of today's message is The Olive Garden. <clears throat> and I'd like you to turn to uh, Matthew 26. Matthew 26. So if you go back and look in the New Testament <clears throat> and you follow Jesus around, you find that he's got 12 guys primarily around him. So you got 13 Jewish nobodies. Right? You say, well, but Jesus did a lot of miracles. Um, they're nobodies. There are people following him, but there are people who had followed other people before. And so pretty much they're just nobodies. There's another, another group of men. Some people believe in him, some don't. And in a minute I'll point out, uh, well, we'll point it out now. If they really believed that Jesus was who he said he was, then when it came time for the Passover meal before he was crucified... The, the, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the rulers of the time would have said, king, right? Your, your holiness, your whatever you come up with, Messiah, come eat this meal with us. No invitations. He has to find a place of his own. So let's turn here to Matthew 26, verse 17. Now on the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And interesting that they're asking, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So this meal is about him, it looks like. Yes, they ate it with him, but these guys all have family. They all got friends. They probably for years before Jesus had said, follow me, had done the Passover together year after year. And now all of a sudden they're doing it, they're doing it with him. And he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So I'm going to do it in your home and I'm going to do it with my disciples. And you look in other passages and it turns out to be an upper room in that home. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And this is a tremendous perplexity still to me, why God would burn, why Jesus would burn one of his twelve picks on a guy who would be a stowaway, basically, in the group. He would steal from the group. Um, he would betray Jesus, as it says here. But for three years, this guy's that close to Jesus. And just a, almost a little parenthetically here, let me say this to you. You can be this close to Jesus and miss him. You can physically, apparently, be with him almost day and night. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah come in the flesh. Be with him, see him, speak with him, be taught by him, see all the miracles, be that close and completely miss it. So he says, one of you is going to betray me. And uh, they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each one of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? Now, it's very interesting that they would even ask this question. I appreciate the fact that they all knew they had capacity for this. Because why would you ask if you didn't think you could? So they go around the table, as it were, and said, is it I, is it I, is it I, is it I? He answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to him that by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. That is not what you want the Messiah saying about you. You would have been better off if you had never been born. And then he's given a signal here. He's dipped, in, uh, dipped his hand with me in the dish, so they all know who that was. Uh, then Judas, who was betraying him, and it's interesting how that's even said, Judas was not about to betray him. Judas was betraying him. It was already going on. Answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you've said it. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant. So yes, they were eating the Passover meal. Yes, the Passover represented the meal that the uh, people of Israel, the, the Israelites ate before they, were, they left Egypt. 
and the death passed over their homes if they had the blood over the doorposts of their house. So that is what this is, that, that blood of those lambs that were killed and that blood sp sprinkled over the, the doorposts of those homes is what caused death to pass over their homes. So that's the meal. But now he says there's a new covenant packed into this meal. Now I'm telling you that this cup that you're drinking this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. So now he's saying, basically, in the Old Testament, the lambs that were killed were physical animals, and their blood was shed to protect you. Now I'm saying there's a new covenant. It will be my blood. My blood will be shed. My blood is what's going to protect you for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So there is a wine tasting coming. And you will miss it if you miss Jesus. And I promise you, he has not had a drop of it until we get there for this moment. So there's a new covenant put in place, a new ordinance for the church. Um, this thing we do along the way where we eat this meal together, break the bread, drink the cup, and remember his death till he comes. So he, he explains what's up at dinner. So the Olive Garden. They're going to go from dinner to the Olive Garden. And it is a lot easier to go to dinner with Jesus than it is to go to the Olive Garden with Jesus. Because if you make it to the Olive Garden, there are things that come after that. Apparently, Jesus loved the Olive Garden, specifically one called Gethsemane, and Gethsemane means oil press. And if you go online somewhere and pull up how they make uh, olive oil, uh, nothing survives. Even the seeds. You say, well, how would you chew up a seed? They grind everything down, and it is pressed and pressed and pressed, and nothing comes out but the oil. And in this garden, something happens. Um, so Jesus and his disciples had dinner and a drink, and they went into the olive garden. So let's keep reading. Verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. So we got Judas out of the picture at dinner. Now they've gone to Gethsemane, the olive, the, uh, olive garden, and he's telling them, okay, you're not betraying me, obviously, but you will stumble. This is not going to be a good night for you guys. Um, and by the way, this is not a place they had never been before. Uh, there's other passages that say that this is somewhere they would go to get away and to pray. So they were familiar with being with Jesus in this garden, uh, but this night was different. Um, Peter, verse 33, Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, you know, Lord, I am the exception. I will never be made to stumble. Um, be really careful. The, the, um, as we'll read in a minute, the spirit is willing, the flesh is, le the flesh is weak. I would, I would encourage you to pray things, not, don't say things to God like, I will never. I would say things to God like, Lord willing, I will never. Realizing that we have capacity for any and everything they did and more. Um, be careful. Let him who stands take heed lest he fall, the scripture says. Jesus said to him, after he comes out being the exception, Assuredly, I say to you that this night, we're not, not we'll get down the road, this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So you want to say you're the guy, you're the exception? Well, that's specifically what you will do. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Uh, and this is very interesting, this phrase, and what he is saying, what he is claiming. If I have to, den if I have to die with you, I will, I will not deny you. Uh, a lot of people are not willing to die because they choose to deny. And this may make a little more sense in a minute. Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So he leaves eight, takes three. So you got a group of eight, 
a group of three, and then he goes off by himself, a stone's throw, another passage says, from even them. And then it kicks in. Um, he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death, stay here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So now you've gone from passing a cup at dinner to trying to find a way to pass on the cup in the garden, in the olive garden. Um, so I'll read you a scripture in a minute that talks about our cross. And Jesus has told him at dinner what's going to happen. It's his body. It's his blood. But now he's on the way to being arrested. But before he's arrested, before he's tried, before he's beaten, before any of this happens, before he's crucified, buried, raised from the dead, you got the Olive Garden. And what happens there? He is aware of what is about to land on him. What he is choosing to do actually you say, well, was he trying to get out of it? Sometimes it's not that we want out of something. Is it, it's just that we are made very aware of, of what this is about to cost. And you can't take these things lightly. So he prays. Um, if it's possible, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But what? Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So we all have stuff in our lives, and I'll read you the biggest one, I think, in a minute. We all have things in our lives where we say, Lord, if there's any way around this, please. But if not, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Make sure that is your prayer. Verse 40, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what could you not watch with me one hour? So apparently Jesus had been out there praying for an hour, going over this with his father. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Now he's saying, look, this is not about me. I needed you guys out here with me to pray and be with me. I've got to sort this out with my father. Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You've got to pay attention. You've got to realize what's at stake, not just for me, but for you in this process. Uh, and how many times in my life have I had something going on, and I'm like, Lord, not my will, yours will be done, and boom, I'm asleep, right? When's the last time you hammered out an hour with the Father about some issue? Now you say, well, who would pray an hour? It depends on the issue. And if you've ever had somebody get sick or you have someone you know and love that is not saved and you have begged God and pleaded with God and, and hammered on the door of heaven, save my friend, save my family member, you may know something about this. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed saying, oh, my father, if this, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Um, he realizes he is about to drink the, the cup of the wrath of God. And the scripture talks about Jesus who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So literally, a sinless lamb of God, Jesus in the flesh, knows he is about to drink a cup of all of our sin, literally not just take on our sin, but become sin for us. It's going to be put on him that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It doesn't get any bigger than this. And he came and found them asleep again, and their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same word. So what has he been praying? If this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. Remember that prayer. Yes, you can ask God. You go further in the New Testament, and Paul had a thorn in the flesh, prayed three times, and got no, no, no. You say, well, how many times am I supposed to pray? If you get a no and you know it's a no, then take the no and say, okay, now much more I gladly will rejoice in my infirmity. When I'm weak, then he is strong, and you keep moving with the challenge. But it, there's nowhere in Scripture that says you can't ask for the cup to pass. But if you get a no, keep moving. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? 
Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, with a great multitude with swords and clubs, came from the chief priests and elders of the people. So, Jesus understood before the garden, but specifically in the garden, in this olive garden, that he was about to have to carry, carry out what he came to do. It's for this reason that he came into the world. So he's about to be arrested and literally become sin for us and be crucified, bear our sins on the cross, be buried, raised from the dead. You say, well, but he made it. Yeah, but when you're headed that way, you still got to go through what you're about to go through. Now go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. So at dinner, he explains the plan. In the Olive Garden, he confirms the plan with his father. There's no way around it. And on the cross, the plan is executed. And he is the plan, and he is the plan that is executed. So then it comes to us. Um, and people say, well, I'm a Christian, or I'd like to be a Christian. So... If you're not, first of all, to anyone who is not a Christian yet, if you're not a Christian yet, yes, if you become a Christian, you say, God, I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus died on the cross, as it described here, been buried, raised from the dead. I accept the gift of eternal life. I want you to come live in me, through me, change me. And here we go. You accept eternal life. It's a gift and you're a Christian. So a lot of people, for some reason, think that's it. Now, if that, if that was just it, then the millisecond you get saved you'd be out of here. He'd, he'd just beam you up or something. You'd be gone. You'd be in heaven. That's not the case. Why am I still here? Because he has work for, for me and work that he has to do in me and through me while I'm still, still here so that we pass this baton on to another generation. But it is more than just preaching the gospel that saves people from hell. It is preaching a gospel that saves them from sin, from self, from everything, every other enemy we've got. Satan, and it works. So yes, you get saved simply by accepting this gift of eternal life. But then what's next? So Jesus lays this out. Luke chapter 9, he said this before he did all that. Luke 9, 21. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell, tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. So they know what's coming. He's been telling them. Then he said to them all, and this is what he said to them, and this is what he says to me and to us. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost for whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man, will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and not the holy angels. So, where is my olive garden? I think a lot of Christians, whether they know it or not, go to dinner. They never make it to the olive garden because they don't want to make it to the cross. Now you say, well, what do you mean make it to the cross? If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, you say, Lord, if there's a way around me losing my life, I'd like to talk to you about that. He says, there's no way around you losing your life because if you hold on to it, you lose it. If you lose it, you find it. And you say, are you sure, Lord? Are you sure, Lord? Are you sure, Lord? And so we wrestle too, too long, too many years with God over, is there any way for this to pass? Instead of just saying, okay, Lord, I get it. I'm going to lose my life. Not my will, your will be done. That's denying yourself. You cannot take up your cross and daily and follow him if you will not deny yourself. And the denying comes in the olive garden of our lives where we sweat this out. Now, you say, well, a lot of people never get there. They just say, got my ticket to heaven, fold it up, put it in my wallet, wait until that day to come. I will not deny myself. And I've shared these scriptures, 1 Corinthians 3, before. There's a bunch of scriptures about this. You know, yes, you'll still make heaven, but you are missing out on his life. Not just your life. You're missing out on his life in your life. Now, you think, well, well what do you mean deny yourself and take up your cross? Here, here's, here's a way I try to 
understand it personally. If Jesus came to me and said, look, um, are you okay with your life being over? I need a vessel. I need a body. I need a place to live and to work and someone to work through. And this is how this is going to go down. If you're willing to deny yourself and say, Lord, I get it. It's not about me. It's not my life, my plans, my goals, my dreams. This is all about you. So he says, okay, you're, you're, we're on board. You've cleared the Olive Garden. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to die. But I promise you this, that when you die, I will enter your body and bring you back to life. But you need to understand that when that happens, I run your life. It is not your body anymore. It is not your life anymore. It's not about your plans, your dreams, your goals, anything. You belong to me, and I will give you power. I will raise your dead body up, but I will be the one living in and through that body. And then we're going to go where I want to go, and we're going to do what I want to do. You say, well, I'm not interested in that. Why? I promise you, folks, it's because we never even think about the cross. We will not deny ourselves. Because the flesh sees something at once. Food, sex, drugs, alcohol, possessions, a place, a trip, or whatever it may be. And God's not against all those things. What he is against is not our ownership of things. It's things ownership of us where it destroys our lives. And we are so consumed with me and my. Why is fasting such a powerful tool? Because it makes us aware of how screaming loud the flesh is. Um, you think your flesh is not alive and well, just fast for a day. Drink water for a day. Check with your doctor first. Fast for a day, and you'll find out your flesh is alive and well. Um, so we say, well, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Not going to happen. You'll make heaven. You'll never be a follower of Jesus unless you follow him. Where did he go? He went to dinner. He went to the Olive Garden. He went to the cross, he went to the grave, and he was raised from the dead. And people say, well, I, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Everybody loves it, and then they put a period there. But the rest of that verse says, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. And nobody wants to die. Because if I die, I lose me, and I don't want to lose me to gain him. But he died to gain me. Why would I not lay my life down to gain him? He said, but Richard, it's not that easy. I got plans. What kind of plans you got? What kind of plans you got bigger than the Messiah living in and through your life, taking over your body and, and saying, here's what's best? You say, I just lost my life. No, you just found your life. Because now it's going it's to matter. It's going to mean something. He's going to do something with it you never could have done. Let me read it again. Then he said, verse 23, Luke 9, he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And there are other passages that just say take up his cross. I picked Luke 9 because I love the fact that he quotes him here as saying daily. So how does this work practically? Every day, before you even get out of a bed, if you've got a bed, you lay there and you say, Lord, I reckon myself dead to sin, alive to you. I choose to deny myself today and follow you. So that means I'm going to take up my cross. What does the cross represent? Death. Death to Jesus in his case, but death to the flesh in our case. And so we say, Lord, I reckon myself, I'm dead. I deny myself today and I'm going to follow you. And he says, well, here we go. He said, well, where are you going to end up? I don't know where you're going to end up the other way. I got too many days where I ended up in some really bad places living it my way. Or just blowing a day up. Total waste. Um, every day can count if you live it this way. Nobody wants to get crushed on the way to the cross. Luke 14. Just a little reinforcement before we're done here. Luke 14, 27.
whether you think I'm just reading you one verse, jerked verse out of here. Luke 14, 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You say, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm one of his disciples. Being a child of God does not make you a, a follower of Christ. Because if you're really a follower of Christ, you're going to go where he says to go. But when you say, well, Lord, where are you going? Like, I'm not going there. Well, you're my kid. Yeah, but I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. Forget that, dude. Not your will. My will be done. I'm not, I'm not passing on this. I'm passing on this. Um, we're not doing this. And, and what happens to us? For years, some believers lock up on some issue and shut it down and say, I will not do this. I will not go there. I will not quit this. I will not yield in this matter. And you say, well, you're still a Christian. Yeah, but then what happens? God keeps turning the heat up because the same book says that he, he chastens those that he loves. So what is the discipline about? God says, look, I didn't just save you to get you into heaven. I saved you to use your life. You belong to me. I'm not going to do it. He says, okay, I keep turning the dial, keep turning the dial, the discipline, the discipline. And what finally happens? You, you say uncle so you can finally say father and get on with the life he intended. How many more years are we going to blow through, wasting time, pursuing things that have nothing to do with what God had for our lives? John 1.29 John 1, 29 says this, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So you're saying, well, I don't believe he's who he says he is. Repeatedly in Scripture, he is the Lamb. He's the one that takes away the sins of the world. So why would you take the blood of the Lamb, apply it to your life, just to get you into heaven when there's not just, he didn't come just to give you life, but to give it to you more abundantly. And that's what this is talking about, what we're reading about. Go to John 18. Uh, you know what? Skip that one. Galatians 2. Go to Galatians 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Now, some of you have these verses memorized. Some of you have heard them your whole life. And for some people, this will be the first time you ever hear this. But this is Paul writing to the church at Galatia, and he is explaining the process. And by the way, if there is no process after you're saved, what in the world is this Bible full of? Why didn't all the people that got saved just get zapped out of here and they're gone? Then there would have been no one left here to, to pass it on. And here we are, the beneficiaries of that. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Literally, this is what Paul says. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when did Paul say that he died? He said, I died when Jesus died. Now, how is that possible? If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things are new. So if you were in Christ when Jesus died, and the only way you can become a, a Christian is for that to be true, when he died, you died. And he says here, I've been crucified with Christ. Uh, it's no longer I who live. So how many people are running this life of yours? Are you partners with Jesus? There's no verses for that. He's either the Lord of your life or you are the Lord of your life or you've assigned someone else, the enemy, to run your life. But he, Jesus is Lord and he intends to be Lord, which means have control, be the boss, run every day, everything, all the time. You say, well, if so-and-so will, will do it, I'll do it with you. Forget about, forget about everybody else. What, what am I going to do? What are you going to do? And then how are you going to answer one day when, when someone's tried to explain this? You get to heaven and Jesus says, okay, what did you not understand? Lord, I understand it all now. I see it now. Let me go back. Let me fix it. And there's no going back. I've been crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. If we really believe that, we would get completely out of the way and let him rip. Have at it. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? It's all about you. And then see where he takes you. I promise you. You say, well, but it could, there could be suffering involved. There's going to be way more suffering for me when I stand before Jesus and have to explain why I missed however many days I've missed. And where I ate up my life with the flesh, with sin, with selfishness, with me. Me, 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 me. 
I want God to bless me, but I don't want to bless God with my life, which turns out to be his life anyway. Now, I understand preaching sermons like this. Um, I run a lot of people off with preaching that gay marriage is wrong and abortion is wrong, and so see ya, right? I get it. And this makes it even worse. Jesus wasn't trying to draw a crowd. He was trying to make disciples. Jesus was trying to communicate that until you lose your life, you will never find it. And we have this watered-down version of something in our country, of too many places, where we're being told just enough, just please, please, please take this, and then we'll leave you alone. The problem is leaving people alone leaves them alone. And they can't figure out, why is, I'm a Christian, why is my life not working? Because until you lose your life, you will never find it. It will never work. Never work. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So if we, I think if I really understood, unless I'm just having a really bad day or wake up just like up yours, God, and you say, oh, who would say that? We're saying that all the time. What do you think you're saying? Well, I would never say it that way. Okay, so you're politely telling him to take a hike. Leave me alone, not my will, not your will, my will be done. Go away. And he said, well, I can't ever leave you or forsake you. Well, then ride along, but shut up already. Turn the music up. Turn the noise up. Try to silence his voice. He will not be silenced because we were very expensive. And he wants what's best for him But that is also what turns out to be best for us. If we will just yield, why will we not yield? And what's amazing about this process is if you are a parent, you're an idiot if you don't yield. Because what do we spend our time? Why don't these children obey? Life would be so simple. Why don't they just do what I'm asking them to do? We won't have these conflicts and all this discipline and all these problems. Why don't they just listen in first-time obedience and we keep moving? It would be a dream. And God says, do you hear the echo? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Paul understood the last part of this. Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If you spend your time thinking about that that he loved you and gave himself for you, you will have a hard time going back to your old life. Galatians 5.24, while we're in Galatians, read that one with me. Galatians 5.24. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, I don't know what your deal is, but I I promise you this, we all got something. We all got something. Um, A lot of people at sex... Nobody knows what your deal is, what you're secretly going around doing, seeing, participating in, and you won't give up illicit sexual stuff. A lot of people, it's some kind of addiction, drugs, alcohol. Now, this is how crazy all this gets. You are literally saying to God, you have no power to deliver me from any of these sins, and frankly, even if you do, I'm not interested. I am not going to pass on this, this cup. I'm going to do what I want to do because I feel good and my flesh wants and needs this. And so, sorry, you're out of luck. Some people are eating up with greed, power. Man, just look at our world. Just do anything. People will kill someone to not lose their position. Uh, Jesus told us, if, you, if you're looking for a position in this world, back to dinner, the Last Supper, on this earth at least, with him, the position he left, the last thing he did for his disciples was get a towel and a basin and wash their feet. You want a, you want a position? There's a good position. Start by serving. Start by humbling yourself. 
before a holy God and saying, look, without you, I am nothing. I've got nothing. In fact, I'm dead. But if I reckon myself dead and you take over, Lord, what could happen? And if you look through history and even today, you find people who have gotten out of the way and said, not my will, your will be done, and got crushed in the Olive Garden. They make it to the cross, and then they make it to the resurrection. And the power of God is manifest in their lives. And their life is changed, and everyone around them is changed. Because you can't stop that. And that, by the way, is what the world's looking for. You say, well, not many. Maybe not many, but it doesn't say not any. And what is so tragic is they read about something in the Scripture, and then they scan the world looking for it, and they can't find it. And then they meet you, a dead man walking with Jesus alive in you. And they go, I want that. I want him. Because my life does not work my way. Doing what I want to do when I want to do it. Satisfying the flesh. Just me, 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 me. I will give up everything I have to gain life. Life eternal. Abundant the way he intended. Colossians 3, verse 1. So we've talked about being crucified. Same guy riding here, Paul, to another, another town, Colossae. And he says here in verse 1, If then you were raised with Christ, so Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. So if you're crucified with Christ, you're raised with Christ. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, <laughs> and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, look at this, just flat out says it. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication. Fornication is simply having sex with someone you're not married to. Uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. In other words, put all this stuff away. Put, put it to death. I, I, I don't want to put something down that that I think I've got to have. But I'm telling you, if you hold on to these things, if I hold on to the flesh and these types of things, I'm going to lose the only life I have. So you say, but, but I'm, I'm a disciple. I'm a follower of Christ. No, you're not. I'm a Christian. I didn't say you weren't a Christian. But don't, don't be claiming follower. Don't, don't say you're one of his disciples. Disciples follow. Where did he go? He went to dinner, the Olive Garden, to the cross. Are you interested in, in that? We all, well, well, we all don't mind going to dinner, but we don't want to get crushed in the Olive Garden because that means we've made a decision to take up our cross, and that's going to cost us everything, but it's going to get us everything too. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And Holy Spirit, there's no way this is going to work without you. But I pray in this room and beyond, people who you have made them aware, and if they're not aware, if they would just simply say, Lord, is there anything that I am trying to pass on that you have not given me permission to pass on? My spirit is willing, Lord. You see it, you know it. But my flesh is weak. I want what I want. I don't want to lose me. I don't want to deny me, Lord, but I sure don't want to die and completely lose me to gain you. I think that's what I don't want. But, Lord, I see now that's the only way this is going to work. So you said to do this daily. So I'm going to start today, and then I'm going to need the faith to wake up tomorrow and do it tomorrow and one day at a time because that's all I get. Father, for people who hear a message like this, and they are, they're searching, and their life sucks, and they really don't even know why. And they have passionately dedicated themselves maybe to some cause, some social issue, some political issue, and it has, it has let them down. It's, it's not worked. Maybe some sin, 
and they've gone as far as they, they think they can go, and there's always farther to go, Lord, and it's going to kill them. And they're tired, and they understand now, maybe for the first time in their life, that, that you've got to love them, God, or you would never have sent your son to live a sinless life, to become sin for us, to take our sin on him, die on the cross, shed his blood, be buried and raised from the dead, and they want in on not just the piece of that that gives them eternal life, but the abundant life. Lord, give us faith to see that if we lose our lives, that's when we find it. And if we hold on to them, we lose them. So save people today, Lord, in this room and beyond. Let them reach out, as it were, the hands of their heart and say, God, I can't go another day. I can't live without you. I can't die without you. I believe I'm a sinner. I admit that. I know that Jesus died for my sins, buried, raised from the dead. I accept the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of my sins, all as a gift. Come live in me. And then show me, Lord, how to live the life that you intended, the way that you say it can be lived. And even if it crushes the old me, I know that will result in the new me, which is you. Life in you. Your life in me. my only hope of any glory. And Lord, for those of us who are Christians who battle this every day, and we don't mind getting in on the gift, but we're not interested in giving our lives for you and truly being your followers, your disciples indeed. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would convict us and show us, shed light on the darkness in our lives. in anything that we hold on to more than you. And give us the ability, Lord, in that olive garden, so to speak, to say, not my will. Yours, yours will be done. And then as having denied ourselves to take up our cross daily and truly follow you. Father, I thank you in advance for the decisions that are made today and every day that change our world, change your your children, and cause us to be the salt and the light that you intended and reduce our embarrassment one day when we give an account for the deeds done in the flesh and whether we truly followed you or not. We love you. We thank you so much for declaring your love for us and, and showing your love for us, demonstrating your love for us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So you're the best. Sure, we'll be great to see you one day. But if it's not today, may this be a day where you're allowed to live in and through us the way you intended. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.